learning process, uh, as you will, and I've been enjoying learning it. Um, so I'll be interested in hearing any, you know, um, points that anyone anyone's got to got to make about where I could go with it next or or uh, whatever in the future. So um, please let me know if if you have any ideas. So uh, before we get going uh, today, I'm going to show you how I've used some scanning that I've had mm -hmm. done on my experiments to um, you uh, create a sampling uh, point map. And then I'm also going to show you how I've used uh, spatial um, georeference sampling to uh, and um, and then do some analysis on that basically to show yield data um, spatially within large field experiments. So um, before we do that, um, I'm going to give you a quick overview about my PhD and um, what the what the aims are and where I want to go with it, basically. So um, the title is a systems level evaluation of conservation agriculture uh, within the UK. Now, for those of you who don't know what conservation agriculture is, it's a farming system that's predicated on three management principles. So it's minimum soil disturbance, which is zero tillage it's or direct drilling as it's known uh, so it's permanent soil organic uh, cover uh, with crop residues or cover crops for example so they can either be living residues or or dead uh, residues and then a, a species diversification of the crop rotation as well so it's um, many many variables and it's a it's a whole farming system so evaluating um a whole systems is challenging for a lot of uh, scientists and coming up with um, methodologies to take uh, all that variation to, into account is um, something that's a, it's a challenge. So um, it has been widely cited that um, this farming system, conservation agriculture, has some yield losses attributed to, to, to it, uh, especially in the first couple of years. And however, uh, a couple of uh, many studies that look at this only really run for two years and there's evidence to suggest that there's a, a transition period of at least five in some cases. Um, so uh, and those negative effects are not present later on up to 10 years, you know, up to uh, 10 years later. Um, so um, we need to consider uh, not only short but long term implications as well. Um, and there all of these variables that we're we're looking at here, so minimum soil disturbance and crop residue management, they have they play a have a large effect on other variables within the field as well. For example, um, IPM, for example, we pest um, and disease control programs, as well as um, fertilisation and spray plans, etc. These are all need to be changed when transitioning to. Um, zero tillage systems and it's the farmer mindset which which changes as well it's not just the machinery and it's not just the the way crops are planted in the field there's generally a lot of other um uh, changes that which go on um when these um sorry for the scrappy presentation but um so generally um what is found is that previous experiments have been confounded by uh, variation in agronomic practice and scientifically um, whilst minimizing those variables that change in experimentation is, is, is good practice uh, it's not that relatable to field systems um, and in some experiments generally when we're looking at farming systems one management or or sometimes both is is performed in a suboptimal way, which is which is not realistic of field conditions. So um, the aim of this project is to uh, take a systems level approach, looking at um, agricultural practice in the UK and uh, implementation of conservation agriculture. So I'm going to talk you through some of the the, the difficulties with looking at uh, this project in 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 some ways. So obviously. In systems research, there's many confounding factors, and uh, it you you cannot try to break down every mechanism within a whole system. Otherwise, it, it's no longer systems research, and in in many cases, in certainly in field experimentation, it's it's quite impossible to uh, isolate all of all of those variables. 
Um, so in a systems experiment, it is the entire system uh, that's the unit of study. Um, and uh, we need to uh, change thinking a little bit from traditional uh, methodologies from that. So uh, my background, um, I've got background in farming and one of my main interests uh, sort of academically is on farm experimentation. Um, so the experiments conducted at a commercial scale uh, with on commercial farms um, and in some cases in collaboration with either farmer groups, agronomists and farmers. Um, and there's several cited benefits to this knowledge transfer, et cetera, uh, and also relevance to the industry in terms of uh, machinery used, the environment and the scale. So some of the um, uh, results from this can be can be quite useful. Um, and it also, and this is the, the main point for today, it can also allow for spatial variable analysis of in-field characteristics, which sometimes traditional experimentation um, cannot, cannot do in, in smaller plots, for example. Farmers have to battle large scale field variation um, regularly and have to account for that in, in their their systems across not only in the field where variation could be very high, but at farm level and then even wider. So when designing on farm experimentation, what we really want to do is minimise the um, uh, um, sort of the administrative and management um, um, problems for the farmer who's implementing it and the, the operators. So um, this is, uh, it should not disrupt crop management operations. It should be flexible, simple, et cetera, and minimize the economic risk. So there's plenty of experimental work going on about um, on-farm experimentation from the, uh, the sort of classic randomized block uh, where you have replication and experimental units and randomization. You have the systematic strip design. Uh, so on the left hand side, this is um, my left hand side, um, the field shots, there's these whole tram lines. So each uh, experimental unit is 24, 36 metres wide um, with a with a tram line in the middle. And then the, uh, uh, the multicoloured uh, schematic on the other side of the screen. Uh, this is like a split planter trial where in precision drills, uh, one variety can be put in one side of the drill and one variety in the other. So we need to, um, all of these methodologies need different ways of analysing the results from them and they regularly differ um, and traditional experimental um, Statistical analysis cannot be applied to all of them um, due to either lack of randomization or uh, lack of replicates. Um, so they, there are various um, designs that are uh, being written about at the moment and being trialed in experiments, some which are very com complex. For example, on your screens now, the split plot, which is um, similar to the, the previous ones, but then it also has um, those plots that are then um, split with another treatment, for example, and then the single strip uh, design, which is in a whole field, it's just one length uh, of the field, um, which is analysed. Now, this is a, a classic one in for farmers, which should generally minimise economic risk by only changing a very small area. So uh, when I was farming, sometimes we try different, you know, fertilizer rates or something, and we try that on one strip down the field. We certainly wouldn't give half of the field over to an experimental design. So this- It's amazing you said that because you, you made me think of my own grandfather who would say, let's try a row with this. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we've, we've probably all, all seen it done. However, in terms of uh, experimental design for, for scientists, this kind of experiment causes uh, a 
a lot of different considerations when it comes to analysis. And this is where um, spatial analysis comes into play. Um, however, this specific design, it, 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 I think there's hot, huge debate about whether you can uh, really draw valid conclusions for for whole whole areas, shall we say, from from this particular one. But there there is certainly a um, lot of potential for some of the other designs that that I've mentioned. So when thinking about on farm on farm experimentation, it they the uh, the experiments are grouped basically on the primary objective, and that's either experiments that aim to quantify crop responses. Um, or experiments that are designed to explore the spatial variability of crop responses within fields. And um, georeference data is, is uh, not a requirement for the, the first option I mentioned, but it, um, if the aim is, is to spatially map the response, then it, then it is, is very necessary to take um, georeferenced point data. So, and in comparison to uh, traditional scientific experimentation, the choice of randomization or systematic plot allocation is affected by the goal of the experiment. And there is some thinking in, in large scale experimentation that um, to properly estimate the treatment effects spatially for the whole area, a systematic design as opposed to randomized is is uh, the preferable option. Um, so uh, that's a quick synopsis of what I'm trying to do and what um, what I'm working on. So my experiment is this one on your screens now. So it's up near Market Drayton. It's uh, 10 hectares over two fields and it is a uh, conservation agriculture and uh, with a a, a sort of a control of the conventional methodology. So the plots are 24 meter tramline strips, which are organized systematically. Um, so, and the plots run the entire length of the field um, with, with a headland for machinery to, to turn on. So here, the uh, conventionally managed uh, plots are in uh, orange uh, or brown color. And then the conservation agriculture plots are in the green color. And the white lines are the machinery tram lines for managing the crop throughout the growing season. So um, as I said, it's, a, it's 10 hectares, so it's a, it's a big trial. And this poses um, different, a different thought process about when looking at things like sampling uh, and um, management of the experiment, essentially. So this is what it looks like in uh, in the flesh. Uh, so we've got the tillage on the uh, right hand side of the screen and then the zero tillage, the conservation agriculture on the left hand side of the screen. Um, so this year we've grown a crop uh, spring beans and we've just harvested and we're just uh, today. Actually, we've been planting uh, wheat for for the coming season. So one of the uh, problems that I had was how do you um, sample this uh, to the most effective uh, in the most effective way and um, basically I did um, with Ed's help I did some power analysis looking at the amount of samples we need to to monitor uh, various uh, variables within the field and when um, Coming up with a sampling design, it's important to uh, over a large areas. It's important to know either one of, of two things. It's either previous knowledge of of the field, um, is that through uh, farmers um, knowledge themselves or agronomists or whatever, or it's by use of some kind of precision agriculture technology. Now, uh, fortunately, we had both of these available to us. Um, the farmer. Uh, who I work with, Martin, who, who has good knowledge of the, these fields, he he told me the, that the areas where he would expect uh, soil textual properties to change and where traditionally um, there had been higher or lower yields in the field. So there was no yield mapping available to me, but he could he could actually verbally explain that to me and show me the areas where he thought there would be um, uh, property variants within the field. 
I also have used um, electrical conductivity scanning, um, which can give us indications of changes within uh, soil textual properties. Um, so EC scanning, it uh, measures obviously that the, the soil is a conductor of electricity and it uh, is measurements of how easily electricity passes through the soil and it can help us to and it's affected basically by soil soil texture um, salt content um, soil moisture and organic matter for example so even though it doesn't really give us data on a uh, on a soil prop a single soil property for example we can safely say that there's soil properties are changing spatially and so that this is what i use to to plot that um uh, visually um so this is the the results of the soil uh, ec scanning where we can see zones clearly defined uh, within the both fields Dying, just before we go on for you to tell me what is the heat map uh, what is what are we measuring here on the scale so it's uh, Sim Simmons per meter squared, which is the the unit, and um, the company that I used for this, they're a commercial firm, and this is pushed to farmers quite regularly. This technology, however, I think it's it, it's fair to say that sometimes it's farmers don't really know how to use it. It's certainly not getting to its the potential uses it it, it could be. Um, so it actually the the maps that I got sent. Uh, didn't have units on. They didn't have a scale. They so this is just the output. So today I'm going to show you what I did with that data, and how that then informed the sampling points that and the experimental design that that I've gone on and used. So is it a measure of like uh, how the potential for the soil to contain water or something like that? So it we it doesn't like it, said. yeah. So it it. It really, it just sort of maps that change. So we don't really know what that change is, be it okay. texture changes, organic matter, but we can definitely say there's probably a difference and maybe to inform um, a sampling plan, for example, instead of, you know, um, less, we, we want to basically um, pinpoint areas of the field at a higher resolution and areas where we don't think there are changes. We can afford to sample at a lower resolution so that that's the that's the idea and so basically this is what i've ended up with um so it's two fields which are mapped into zones um uh with a a buffer a three meter buffer for edge effects around each plot and then um 250 sampling points which are are then randomly generated within each uh, soil zone so it's five per soil zone and 25 per plot so today i'm going to show you some of that process on r uh, and uh, qgis as well so okay and then we're going to uh, use preging which i don't know if everybody's familiar with it um we've only mentioned it a few times over the course of things but uh, this will be a bit of a whistle stop tour I'm, I'm no expert by any means um so it's a it's a method of um estimating the value of a variable um across a, a a spatial field um and it can be a useful tool in 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 spatial analysis so I'll, I'll show you how to do that very very basically on our so okay so right um well, that's uh, sorry. I'll um, start from the beginning on this one. So, can everyone see my screen? How does how does that look? Do you want me to zoom in or maybe click it up a time or two? Yeah. Okay. Um, now on uh, Windows, that would be Control Shift uh, Plus. I might not risk it. I might go <laughs> go manual. Um, Sorry, oh, may I ask uh, a question? Yeah. It's it's Sarah Parsons. Sorry, I'm at yeah. home. Not. Um, Is that a bit better now? Yeah, that's good. I'll take out the contents as well. Okay. So here we're going to look at um, the um, EC raw data, 
and um, try and make some better Kriegi maps than the ones that the company sent. So um, uh, we'll set the working directory. Um, we're loading a, a variety of, of packages. Um, and then we'll have a look at the, the data set. So, so the data set looks like looks like this. So it's automatically generated. So you, you have the, the date uh, and the, the time, and then you also have the X and Y coordinates in the um, WSG84 uh, um, CRS, which is the, the, the most normal, it's the one Google uses. Um, and then the speed that the scanner was going at at that time. And I've changed a couple of the column names just so they're, they're easier to understand. So the ones that we're interested in basically are the deep EC scan and the shallow EC scan. So we're just going to have a, have a look at them now. So the first thing to do is to have a look at the point, the, the, the point data, um, just to see where, um, that the, uh, points taken are from the um, right geo locations um, and what the data actually looks like. So it's important to visualize that. So I'm just reading in there the um, the title. I'm just being lazy there. Uh, the notation on R um, sometimes is painful for me to do. So I'll just read it in once and then um, that's it. So the first thing is to read in this data set um, and uh, plot the X and Y coordinates and then the uh, a point points of the um, deep EC scan um, um, and depending on the on the size of that. So we'll have a look at that and then uh, if it works, the output. So if it when it my computer doesn't die. So here we can see um, the point map of the of the scanning, so with the uh, X and Y coordinates and the um, point data from the EC scan um, um, with a legend there. May I just ask, this is the data from the company that did the scanning? Yeah. And would you, like as a farmer or an agronomist, would you typically get the data or did you have to? No, I had to really press them for this. Um, so, but I would encourage any farmer to do it because if you pay for it, then it, you should have it, shouldn't you? Really, um, and um, and then also field two. And I thought I'd leave this in when it loads because this is the um, result of uh, field two, and this is the importance of uh, visualizing your data because what we've got here is not a very good uh, point map of my field but a really good map of the road back to the farmer Martin's house uh, as the scanner was not turned off. Um, so um, before we do anything more with this, we're going to quickly remove these outliers. Um, uh, there's probably a better way to do this, but here I'm using uh, the data dot table library and then a, a function to iterate through uh, 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 the data frame by column and row and then replace values to NA. So here we, we run this and I, this probably, like I said, there's probably a better way, but I'm just removing anything over certain X and Y coordinates here and then replacing them. Um, and then this should be the result when it loads. And, and as you can see, you, you get a bit of a, a bit of a better map. You still have a, a tail of where the scanner left the field, but it's, it's enough for us to visualize those. Um, and then we can um, uh, compare the, I'm getting a few warning messages there, but I think it's just because I removed values and then you can compare the two, albeit not, not particularly well. So um, when we're uh, going on to uh, estimate these values with Krieging, we need to uh, produce and fit uh, a, a variogram and a variogram model. Now for this, I'm using the, the library um, auto map, uh, which is very useful. I, you can do all of this manually on R, um, but if you're just getting started, I would probably recommend using an auto fit function as it uh, allows you to 
well, it, it iterates through various models basically and chooses the best one for you. Um, and you, you can still play around with it after, but I'd prob probably start off with this one. Now, before you start doing any of this, it's important to change your data frames into spatial points data frames. And you do this by specifying the um, X and Y coordinates here. Um, so we'll do that quickly. And then the coordinates function in AutoMap. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, um, I'm getting another warning message about those NA values now, but I don't think it matters too much. So when we look at the class there, we see that it's now a spatial points data frame, and that's what we um, that's what we want. So um, now we want to plot a semi variogram, um, which, as I've, I've put there, it depicts the spatial autocorrelation of the measured point samples. Um, so we do that by uh, function variogram with the uh, variable of interest and and the the data set, and this plots something like that. Uh, a, a semi variogram there uh, they are and then we we use the auto fit function which then iterates through uh, various models uh, and and then uh, the various values that um, uh, help to fit the model so the seal the range um, uh, and the nugget value which if you're just starting to learn about this can be you you have no clue about uh, those things, it, it, I still struggle with it sometimes, to be honest. Um, so, are uh, getting a, another. Um, I think it just removed some some of the models there because they they didn't fit, and the result is that, like here, um, you you get a an, a, a variogram model fitted with suggestions for the best fit. Um, so that the nugget sill and, and the, the model to use um, so um, here so I think this is a, a made term model so once the the variogram uh, and the model have been fitted and plotted what we need to do then is to plot the grid area which we need to estimate to um, now I did this on QGIS um, uh, it, it quite simple. So you have um, have your um, plot area there, and you can generate a grid over that um, by um, I can't. There we are by um, research tools if it works, and then create grid, and you can specify a point grid, and then clip it down to the area of interest. So I have for um, for this um, uh, bit of work, I have um, some uh, an outline of both fields and I generated generated a, a grid uh, and then cut it to that to that one to that uh, size. So we load uh, the, the grid, um, which um, is in this CSV here, so we just have a, have a look at that. As you can see, it's just in a CSV format, so it's the X and Y grid coordinates, um, uh, uh, and that's it. Um, now, um, it's in a different coordinate reference system, so we quickly have to um, change that, and this is the, the library SF, um, and here we're just uh, specifying where the grid coordinates are, and then, the making a new data frame and um, changing the CRS um, to uh, the one that I'm using for my project. Now, I don't know too much about this, but someone recommended it to me that I used a local CRS for, as it, some think it's maybe slightly more accurate. Um, again, I think that, that that might not be strictly true, but um, so I'm changing this from the, um, WSG84, which is used a lot, and I'm using the British National Grid for mine, um, but I think you, it, it doesn't really matter either way. Um, so here you're just um, transforming the CRS um, in a data frame, and then you're assigning uh, those 
uh, new coordinates uh, to F underscore grid. Um, and now that's done, now that the same CRS, you can then plot the point grids. So this is the points with, me with the measurements that we've already got. Uh, and then this is the grid which we want to estimate. Um, OK, and so when we uh, arrange those, you can see uh, there that they're in the same CRS and um, the area uh, we want to do. So um, again, uh, I think I've already done that, but we specify the coordinates and um, and then check the check the class. So they're both spatial points, data frames is what, what we want. And now we're getting on to uh, the creaking part of this. So um, there's again, you can do this manually or you can use um, some um, auto Krieging functions. Uh, probably again, the auto Krieg is maybe the way to go to start start off with. Um, although maybe if you manually, there's more more options uh, if, if you do it like that. So here we're running uh, the auto Krieg with the deep EC scan um, with the from the data set CSV DAP um, and then uh, estimating uh, over um, F grid. And then when we plot this, um, again, it's probably not showing particularly well on, on here. Um, but one of the, the good things about this is it also um, estimates the standard error um, and uh, gives some values for the Krieging predict prediction from this um, and, and shows the, the variogram as well. So that um, can be useful. Um, and then this data then can then be um, plotted um, by changing the spatial object back to a data frame um, and then um, plotted um, like this, or albeit in a higher resolution than what I've got it there. Um, so, and then it's a, a spread. You can then see a, a good spread of um, the data. Um, now, what the, one of the reasons I was doing this was I wanted to compare what um, I was sent by the company um, to what I, the data, the raw data actually looked like. So if we then, read these two uh, shape files in, which is the shape files that I had to push the organization to, to send me instead of just PDF uh, maps of these fields. Um, we can then have a look at the results from um, my Krieging and, uh, and theirs. Um, so they're using um, uh, like a smoothing option to create these more smooth zones. However, obviously in in real life, it, you don't have those just abrupt cutoffs of of um, you know of any variable. Do you? these? It's an estimation at the end of the day, um, and uh, a horrible color scheme there for you. Um, so that's um, what I used. And then if we flip back to QGIS. I then used these uh, overly simplified to create five soil zones throughout uh, my experimental uh, units. Uh, and then um, I, I use this to then um, randomly generate um, sampling points throughout them within using the, the soil zone and the plot uh, as, as factors. So that's how I did it. Now, getting to uh, data collection from these points. We're going to um, show you how I did that as well, and then some of the results uh, um, from, from some of the yield data that I collected. So it's a very, very similar script, to be fair. So I'll just set the working directory uh, and load the data set in. So um, this data set is, um, my um, agronomic uh, data data set basically for for this year for this this crop. So we have um, sample name, field plot, block, uh, the treatment, 
soil zone and then the uh, X and Y coordinates in um, WG uh, S84, uh, the what free words um, uh, coordinates as well. The, the, the devil, someone's saying. <laughs> and and then we, we also have our agronomic data from throughout throughout the year um, of plant heights, etc. So um, we don't have time to look at all of this, but I'll quickly show you how I generated some creeding maps of the spatial yield throughout the field. Um, so again, um, it's important to plot and look at the data points. Um, so as as we can see here, um, I'm using a different CRS this time, um, but this is you can see that plotted on the X and Y axis, but you can see yield in tons to the hectare um, shown in, as point data, and you can see the, the spatial spread of, of those samples throughout the field. Now, this is the um, one of the sort of test data sets, for example, and then um, since they, since then I've actually opted for to add more sampling points than what a question. Oh, sorry. John, uh, my raises a hand raise, not a question. Yeah. Sorry, my question is: How did you measure the yield data? Did you have? Uh, yeah, sorry. Magda, please go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't see the chat. Sorry. Joe, how did you measure the yield data? Was it from the hand harvest? Oh, sorry, it's so cold, so dark uh, in the room. Or it was from a mm, uh, plot combine? Oh, no, sorry, Magda, it was a, a hand harvest because um, the design of the experiment is quite lar large scale. Um, it's it's difficult to um, get, a, you know, a plot combine probably it would take about a week to combine the whole thing. So this is hand harvest data, so from a, a quadrat. And then also um, what we did was we used the combine yield monitor, which I haven't quite had chance to, to analyze just yet. Um, um, uh, and then we've also taken each plot, harvested each plot individually, and then taken it over a weigh bridge, accounting for the mm -hmm. weight of uh, you know the tractor and trailer. Sure. So uh, I'm quite interested because I did my hand harvest as well, and it was quite a pain. Yes. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what uh, size was of this particular point where you hand harvested? Because you had quite a lot of points, didn't you? How yes. many How many points did you eventually uh, have? Uh, 150 in in this in this sampling block, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I took a a 33 centimeter quadrat um, from each point um, and um, took uh, biomass as well um, and so took all the plants with, with me yeah and then right. yield as well is a, is a 33 centimeter so one. to every point you took the gps antenna you just uh, found the point yeah. was it I, like this i'm actually working to uh a lower uh, GPS ac GPS accuracy than the base station, um, which is maybe rightly or wrongly, but I, again, because this is sort of on farm, I sure. kind of feel like I wanted to use kit, which was more available to, to farmers. So I'm using a Garmin eTrex 22, something like that, which has a, a probably a 95% accuracy of like three meters or something. So it's not, it's not fantastic accuracy. Yeah. Okay. And are you planning to uh, follow the, to use the same uh, sampling points for your whole experiment for the that next is, years? That is the plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. You. No problem. Sorry. Um, so um, we'll just uh, so again. Uh, now we've we've had a look at the the points um, throughout the field. We don't. I've uh, commented it this out because we uh, don't need to remove any variables. Again, we're using um, specifying the coordinates uh, uh, and looking at the class of the of the data, and then we're fitting um, 
a variogram again, but this time for beans a uh, ton to the hectare uh, from the data set, and then auto fitting a, a variogram, which, like I said, iterates through various uh, variogram models. And here we can see uh, a different variogram this time using a spherical model, and then with quite an obvious um, range as well, where the autocorrelation uh, drops off over a, 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 a further distance. Um, so we're using for this, we're using the same grid as I used in the in the other uh, other code, which is the uh, F grid to uh, look at over. But uh, yeah, this time it's for both fields. Sorry, so we're we're estimating point um, variables for for both fields now. And then uh, we're plotting those so we can see all of the points there that were taken throughout the field, all of the hand harvest data. And then we're going to have a look at the grid as well. And as you can see, the uh, we're estimating all of the uh, grid points within the field and we're comparing the two. Um, we're specifying the coordinates which we've done. Um, we don't need to glimpse the data. And then we're going to run the Krieging now for in within the data set, looking at uh, tons to hectare, yield tons to hectare across uh, the grid. Um, and plotting that. Now, in the future, I'd like to experiment with some other forms of Krieging, not just ordinary Krieging, but I'm not quite quite there yet in my in my knowledge. Um, so here we can see the Krieging prediction and the standard error uh, range, which ranges quite a lot throughout the field where we get more standard error uh, in certain parts of, of the fields, depending on how the sampling density of, 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 of that area. Um, and with higher resolution sampling, we get less standard error is what we can say for that. And then when we, um, um cast the object to a data frame and then we can then plot that with um gg plot we can then produce a yield map based on the hand harvest data uh spatially um and we can then make a prediction so i did this in the summer i wanted to make a prediction about how much yield would the whole crop um uh, make and it showed that um, if, if we look at the prediction, the mean of the prediction, it was estimating three and a half tons to the hectare. Um, what it actually yielded uh, when we actually came to combine it was more than that. So it actually yielded four and a half tons to the hectare. So I can surmise that something in my sampling process or my um, um, estimation, my Krieging, was a bit off. I would probably say I didn't take enough samples or I didn't um, uh, use enough, um, yeah, big enough area to sample. Maybe a, a, a larger quadrat would have been a better, better option. Um, so that's what we can we can take from that one. And then I've also used this process to exclude uh, data points, obviously, uh, from one treatment and then uh, exclude uh, uh, them from the other and then you can create maps yield predictions of the field um, if the field was just managed by one system um, so that's uh, that's been what I've been doing um, I'm pretty sure there's further avenues to take this uh, methodology in the future but I haven't I haven't quite got there yet so great question in the chat I'll read it out if you can't uh, get to it. It's uh, oh yeah, I just got it's from Matt Butler. Does the creeping assume that one unit of lat is the same magnitude as one unit of lot? Oh, I think so, but I'm not sure. And it does. That's a great question. It totally does. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it yeah. Totally does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when we're Way far away from the equator, yeah, it biases things a little bit. Biases yeah. Things a bit. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what, why, you know, I think it would could be better. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm just switching the camera on. Uh, I think it could be better to perform the Kriging in BNG directly. Is it is it what you did or you uh, because I could see conversion from BNG to WGS and Kriging was in these Angular units. Was it like that? Or am I mistaken? <laughs> Yeah, I um, with the EC data, I yeah, I transformed them that way. Yeah, so it might so be better. It might be were better the original the uh, data um, EC data transformed to um, British National Grid, which is very much uh, which is locally rectangular, locally orthogonal, and has identical units. Was it that case? Yes, that's oh. the one the CRS I've tried to use is the the local one throughout, um, which yes. I, for, I, for some, yeah, some people think is the way to do it, but I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure it makes too much of a difference. Like Ed, what what do you think? Um, there's an argument if your only audience in the whole world is a is a GIS expert who uh, is British and over about 60 years old, definitely use the British grid. Yes. But if it's for scientists around the world, you've got to use one of the standard ones. But the short answer is it doesn't matter that much because we can all transfer back and forth. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but it, it can make a difference for the Kriging. And in terms of the field, we are only thinking locally. So this is the moment when I would be using British National Grid for the whole underlying mathematics of Kriging. And I think then we can safely say that the units are the same in both directions. To answer yeah. Matt's question. Yeah, to answer Matt's question, <laughs> because this is yeah, meter yeah. then. Yeah. Um, for a while about which CRS I should use, and I'm if I'm honest, I'm still not not sure. Maybe I'm too sure. Yeah. OK. The, yeah. OK. Can I ask a question? Uh, you may have answered this and I may understand it, but I just wanted to ask again is uh, for the for the combine yield. Um, you, you have the combine yield data. Is it geolocated in the field? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. You have this kind of big discrepancy of the magnitude of it and you suggested that it might be the sample size or sample sample bias i just wondered i just wondered um whether you could ask since you have the spatial coordinates of mm. both of them what what the correlation was like because if it was just a if it was just a uh, magnitude difference yeah um then there should be a higher correlation than if there was a sam actual sampling error yeah, it might be interesting to look at that um, with a matrix correlation. OK, yeah, matrix. Very easy to do. Yeah. Uh, OK, I, I'll, I, I would I'll... be interested in looking at that with you. Okay. Yeah, OK. That. Oh, that, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Mental test. Yeah, <laughs> OK, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, uh, George has another comment in there in the chat about DSAT. Yeah. Maybe George or Matt could tell us whether there's a uh, field beam DSAT module. Well, I was hoping to get uh, more involved with uh, DSAT in the future. I've never used it, but hopefully um, I can see, really see the potential for using DSAT in this project, and I'd like to give it a go. Yeah, it would be interesting because they've got the seasonal element of that as well um, and the spatial element. So you can use that within the, within the modeling. I do think there is a bean one, um, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, modeling over over time as well is is that's important in, in um, agricultural systems as well, not just the spatial variance. But yeah, that would be good. There uh, crop rotation on these fields you're working in. You said you're in a sample long term. Is that already set by the agronomists? Um, yeah, so I set it really. The only thing that um, so I forgot to mention that both plots, uh, both treatments, they're managed independently 
by uh, professionals, by agronomists. So one that specialises in sort of uh, commercial conventional agronomy and then one that specialises in conservation agronomy. Um, so I have I make none of the decisions uh, in the field, but I, I tell them to to push their their systems and manage them commercially. Um, and I try not to um, hold them back on decisions like if, if whatever that they want to do with whatever they think is the best decision we try and go with. I have to make compromises at points. So um, the, the one thing that I do make them keep the same is the crop each year. Um, so we have to make some compromises on the crop rotation. Um, but that's just to ease comparisons a little bit, um, you know, seasonally. Pose some kind of order on the way. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to just let them get on with it, but it would just um, it'd be a bit of a, a nightmare. I have another question about the uh, Siemens measurements. Um, do you know about the Hutchinson's Omnia? Yeah. And how how do they what, are they measuring something similar or? So I th I think the uh, the terra mapping the Omnia terra mapping uses. Uh, believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but I think it uses sort of gamma isotopes. Isotopes, isotopes yeah. yeah. Something like that. Um, whereas this is just um, electric. A probe in the soil and doing something. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, terra terra mapping can read a lot more, um, or suppose <laughs> supposedly. Uh, um, so I'm I'm really trying to get it for this uh, field. So it, I think it is sort of paid for for these two fields, but oh. we haven't had it scanned just yet. Oh. Maybe in the next couple of weeks. Okay. So I would love to come out when you have it done. Yeah. If I can, I will come yeah. Out. So that that will be a fantastic data set for for us to work with on this project. Correlation. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, fingers crossed for that one. I think this is really good. We're right at the end of our time. Any any final questions? Do you have some files that you can share with us or you, if you push them to me, I can share them in the typical yeah. fashion. Yeah, I have I have some files of, of all of this so I can um, send them send them your great. way. Any final questions? I'm going to stop the recording here. Thanks so much. Let's give uh, let's give Joe a round of applause. That was excellent.